increasing. Uh, for an example, in this case, the mass rose from 3.03 million tons to over 3.1 million tons, with, of course, with some fluctuations there and there, depending on what is happening in the, in the, in the, in the economy or also some climatic conditions that can also, also affect the, 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 the fresh produce. And we realized that the highest mass was recorded in 2015 and 2018 and 2019. Most of most traded commodities in this national fresh, fresh produce markets are the potatoes, followed by onions, uh, tomatoes, and 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 and, and banana. Um, however, I think what is coming out here is that while the national fresh produce market appears to be performing well, this doesn't necessarily bring an ideal picture or the targets. Uh, that we that have been recommended in the in the section uh, uh, seven uh, study, uh, so the, the the target does not resonate with actual uh, reality, indicating that the issues of transformation in the sector remain the one which is contentious and remains unfinished, uh, uh, even after twenty years, uh, twenty seven years uh, into democracy. So some of the challenges in the national fresh produce market. Uh, is that the performance of the national fresh produce markets relative to the production of growth in fresh produce sector may be attributable to a failure by these markets, maybe to respond to some of the challenges presented by the deregulated uh, market environment. And these uh, uh, factors include regulatory environment in the national fresh produce markets, your infrastructure, the safety and security, hygiene, cleanliness, and food security standards, issues of slow supply chain and uh, uh, recruitment processes and human capital development. However, as the NMC, we believe that in order for us to know exactly how the transformation is taking place or how the, 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 the participants by, uh, uh, as recommended by the, by, the, by, by the committee needs to be unpacked is that we need to understand how this data can be disaggregated to allow the traceability uh, and to measure the true reflection of the market participants or, or the participation of the smallholder farmers in the national fresh produce uh, markets. Uh, however, the efforts by the government and other fresh produce industry stakeholders in the context, context of projects with birth initiatives remain very co uh, commendable, as well as the cooperation between the relevant stakeholder, especially the Department of Cooperative Governance and traditional affairs. Uh, this, of course, the continuous uh, engagement uh, in this uh, of this nature will play a very uh, significant role in ensuring that the national fresh produce market remain key market access point for smallholder farmers. Uh, going to the last part of uh, my presentation, um, uh, indeed, it is important that. Uh, uh, we, we, we get the market access right, and, and, uh, but we should also understand that uh, South Africa uh, exists in a global world, and whatever happens in the global environment uh, also affects the, 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 the macroeconomic variables or indicators in our country. So the fact that we operate in a global environment, it is important that, of course, we understand the context we, we are operating on and this uh, report basically is uh, trying to highlight uh, how global market forces such as the production input cost, uh, fuel and freight affect put, uh, food prices uh, that consumers uh, play, uh, pay. And I think for this, for the purpose of this, the market trends we're going to look at it will be on the input cost such as the fertilizer, freight, and rail, and the, and then of course how these play an important role in the ultimate determine, uh, determination of the prices that consumers uh, pay. Looking at the input cost, uh, uh, if one look at the issues of input cost in terms of the fertilizer, uh, looking at the period between 2015 and 2021, uh, one can see that there's indeed an indication that fertilizer is currently less affordable. And you can see also that between 2015 and 2021, the local uh, uh, fertilizer prices for some of these uh, fertilizers that we use, such as urea, MEP, and KCL, have increased dramatically. 
I will not get into the details of, of the, 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 the exact quantities, as the exact prices, as you can see, just in the interest of time. Uh, uh, in terms of the crude oil and fuel prices, similarly, uh, one can see that uh, global factors such as natural gas shortages in Europe and other uh, factors that, are, uh, that actually play a role in, in the global uh, developments uh, also affect uh, the local fuel prices. And of course, uh, we know that uh, on the 3rd of November, there was a, a big hike in, the, in, 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 in petrol and, and, and diesel and illuminating paraffin. And uh, unfortunately, I have not updated the recent uh, in, uh, increases, which happened, uh, I think it was the uh, end of February. I, I, I think it's end of February. I can't remember the exact date. But the, you, you, we, one can see that uh, the, 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 the global uh, issues that are happening uh, out there also affect how uh, our local prices for uh, input costs such as your crude oil and fuel prices are determined. In terms of the food prices, all these uh, input costs, of course, they get into the issues of production, whereby, of course, the end consumer the end user of these products is the, is the consumers. And unfortunately, when the costs are high in the uh, production process, uh, that ends on the, on the table of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the consumers in terms of uh, uh, the price that they pay. As you will know, the NMC has a monthly 28 food item food basket that we use to track food prices in South Africa. Uh, what is interesting here is that in 2008, an ordinary South African consumer paid about 364 rands for an NMC food basket when compared now to the October 2021, which is about 985 rands per basket. And that represents an increase of about staggering 171% over this period. So I think what is coming out here is that there's certainly the, there is a concern in terms of the inflationary pressures uh, that uh, uh, consumers are experiencing in terms of the food affordability. And uh, some of the uh, selected products that we looked at, uh, just looking at uh, what are the products that ha are contributing mostly to these increases in the food basket. We uh, find that animal protein, dairy and eggs, bread and cereals are some of the uh, uh, food items with the highest price level. Uh, and then, of course, this could also be the fact that some of the inputs that we use to produce these uh, products are also uh, imported and they come from uh, other countries. And, and, and of course, if there are any uh, global uh, uh, issues uh, or developments that uh, maybe affect the supply in this, in this, in, in, in this inputs also affect the ultimate price that the consumers uh, pay. Um, and then uh, going on to the status of food availability and out outlook in South Africa, I think we fully understand that uh, uh, food availability uh, or food security is an important thing. But uh, of course, we must also be able to understand that even when the country is food secure, there could be people that are not able to uh, have adequate food on the, on the table. So while South Africa is a food secure at a national level, it might be food insecure at the household level, since not all households have adequate food. And of course, this also talks to the issues of uh, food uh, affordability. And we just looked at some limited uh, commodities here uh, to just give an overview status of uh, food uh, status in the country. And uh, we looked at maize, wheat, and, and sunflowers. Uh, in terms of, uh, of maize production, one can see that uh, the amount of, of maize, uh, of, of area cultivated for maize, has been fluctuating over the years. And probably it could be due to the shift to more prof uh, profitable crop. It is interesting or it is uh, it, it's good to note that the total maize crop for 2021 is expected to be over 16 million tons, up by 16% from about 15 million uh, of, of 2020. Okay. Um, in terms of the white maize uh, total supply and demand, 
uh, despite supply constraints, sometimes due to climatic condition, total demand has always been sustained. Um, where the demand has not, uh, where there is a shortfall, of course, there have always been imports from, uh, from other countries. So, but however, the overall supply has saved by about 20% due to favorable weather condition in 2021, while demand increased by 12% due to considerable increases in human consumption as well as a higher feed demand. In terms of uh, which may is the human consumption, I think here it is important that uh, when we're talking about uh, maize, uh, uh, maize human consumption, we talk about this with also within the context of the growing uh, population for in order for us to plan uh, better. So, so as you can see, the human uh, population in 2021 was recorded at over 58 million people. And of course, as the uh, population uh, uh, increases, one expects, of course, a higher consumption in, of some form. And in terms of export volumes, uh, the export volumes uh, fluctuated over the 10-year period due to limited market av availability, tight supply, and the rebound in most of our output um, uh, uh, of, uh, our, of the output in African uh, markets. When they were able to uh, produce for themselves, we were not able to export to this country. So in terms of wheat production, uh, the wheat is the most second uh, significant crop in South Africa. And uh, we can see uh, that uh, Western Cape province is one of the uh, South African leading uh, wheat uh, producing uh, uh, province. And uh, I think what is worth noting here is that um, a total of over 2 million tons were produced during the 2021 uh, production season. Uh, breaking the 2 million ton barrier for the first time since 2008. And this was done with uh, a less uh, 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 amount of hectares planted. And uh, this, of course, could be contributed to the fact that probably we have better yielding cultivars and we have good agronomical practices. Uh, in terms of wheat uh, production and imports and human consumption, I think uh, uh, increases in women uh, in wheat production in 2020 bode very well for the countries, uh, meaning that the wheat import volumes also dropped due to the fact that we were able to uh, have a better production or a yield in the in the country. And uh, and then in terms of wheat, wheat process for human consumption, this averaged at about over three um, uh, million uh, million tons. Um, I'm going to try to rush now uh, in the interest of time. Uh, as you will know, that uh, South Africa operates within the global environment. Uh, so the prices of, uh, of wheat, of course, are determined by also the forces that are happening in the, in the global environment. I think what needs to, uh, what needs, uh, to, to come out here is, is that uh, during the 2021 marketing season, the domestic wheat uh, price average uh, between uh, 5,000, over 5,000 a ton, and about uh, uh, 6,000 uh, a, a ton. Okay, yeah. So in terms of the uh, sunflower seed and retail sunflower oil, um, uh, the, the average domestic surface sunflower pr price increased by over 30, by 32% from December 2020 to December 2021. And of course, this increase in sunflower seed uh, domestic price could be attributed to the increase in demand and the decline in, uh, uh, in local uh, uh, production. And the retail price of sunflower oil, of course, it's showing an increase um, uh, of 19% from 2020 December to 2021 uh, December. So in terms of the conclusions, um, I, I, I think uh, increases in the maize and wheat production are largely seen as very good things uh, in terms of preserving food security in the country, uh, where of course food availability is one of the major priority uh, for the country and also due to the fact that we are uh, due to also the country's growing population. Uh, in terms of the wheat production season, uh, that is remarkable because for the first time uh, uh, we surpassed 2 million tons uh, of, 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 of wheat produced, uh, resulting in low import uh, uh, volumes. And uh, 
looking at the issues of, uh, of, of, of maize, it is anticipated that uh, this will be ab about uh, to be about six, over 16 million tons, uh, the second highest harvest on record, uh, which um, I think has been finalized already uh, according to the to the cr crop estimate uh, committee. Uh, on the on the back of favorable weather condition, the 2021-2022 production season appear to be on track. Uh, we are expecting yet another bumper crop, and of course, with the uh, continued heavy rains uh, for several uh, regions in the countries, in the countries, potentially that might result in lesser crop than earlier projected. Um, some policy recommendation. Uh, it is believed that uh, uh, an integrated uh, uh, approach is, is quite important or crucial in ensuring growth and sustainable agricultural sector. And sunflower seed industry is one industry that uh, it's, uh, it will need uh, more uh, investment due to some of the diseases that uh, are experienced in this, in this, in this sector. And uh, of course, research into potential export markets uh, such as deep international sea market, particularly for white maize uh, and other often crops will be important. And uh, I think uh, the solution, of course, to a food secure countries goes beyond focusing on just few uh, mentioned commodities, but should include other untapped crops that are unsaturated uh, where they can be produced with limited Hi. market barriers. Uh, and invitingly. Bergman. Is, can you please mute your microphone? You may proceed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was my first slide basically saying the solution to a food secure country will go beyond focusing on just few mentioned commodities uh, where diversification can be explored. Uh, on especially for those untapped crops uh, that are unsaturated and also that can be produced with limited market barriers and under resilient climate conditions. And that is the end of my presentation. And thank you for listening. Uh, back to you, Chair. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Tempia, for the NAMEC uh, presentation. Um, DJ? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, if I may request that um, Ralph takes uh, the presentation up so that I can be able to present on it. Let me just indicate that yesterday there was um, an engagement with the chair on the very same presentation. And I would like to paraphrase this in terms of the request that came from the uh, PC. And I would like to, with your permission, chair, while the presentation is going up, read the first bullet that says that the, re the regulatory framework that deals with the existing legislation and policies that regulate export marketing including weaknesses or implementation. Chairperson, that bullet, um, as, as paraphrased, is a bullet that um, I have got to talk to, Chairperson, uh, to say around the, the mid-1990s, South Africa took a position, and that position was that we are going to deregulate um, in our market. And that position was taken um, within the context of the NGAT and later on within the WTO to say, uh, we are going to do away with the marketing boards that we had um, in the past. And part of those um, were then consolidated. And some of the issues that were to do with the marketing boards were then taken into the uh, context of the, um, the now uh, that we call the Marketing of Agricultural Products Act, um, which signifies quite a few issues, uh, Chairperson, um, within our context. And this is where the NMC, I think, in terms of their presentation, uh, Chairperson, we're focusing um, on the work 
that the NMC is doing. Uh, part of those is looking at the, the that result of um, the mid 90s uh, decision that was taken by this country. So to be technically correct, uh, Chair, um, there would be no legislation that would be uh, responsible for export marketing. And I want to be to, 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 to be technically correct on the issue. Export marketing per se, um, except that the current MAPA Act would be looking at maximizing the profits that uh, the people would be getting due to export marketing uh, indications. So subsequent to the discussions and noting this introduction that I'm making, Chair, um, and our discussion, I thought that maybe um, the, the discussion would have uh, gone to a point which says that um, based on the on the current exports that we are having as a country, what is that that we as a country um, are having within the regulatory framework in terms of export? And this have got um, have got an impact in terms of compliance, and that compliance is not necessarily marketing chain. But I thought that we needed to bring that context through um, uh, on, on on a serious basis, but. If we have got to be techno around it, it's, it's, it's not a marketing per se, but it assists in terms of bringing much needed uh, uh, capital for our country, foreign earnings for our country. If, if you allow me, Chair, I will then request that I be allowed to share the presentation, the, the updated presentation, Ralph, if you can just put the updated presentation up, because this is an uh, older version. Uh, of the presentation so that I can be able to then run through it and explain the context in terms of le the legislative arrangements that we have um, as a country uh, when we deal with exports, uh, honorable chair and honorable members of the portfolio committee. Now, broadly speaking, there are a few elements that we have got to look at when we export. Um, the first one is that South Africa is a member of a few um, organizational uh, arrangements in the world, uh, international bodies. One of those is the, is the WTO, um, which uh, really gives us a few trade rules that we have. The WTO has got a few annexes, um, and these annexes will deal with specific areas. And for the purposes of this discussion, I will be concentrating on the areas around um, your animal health, plant health. You would also have issues around uh, intellectual property rights. So th that would be at the highest level. And underneath those, there, there would be recognition by the WTO of different standard setting bodies, which, is, which are those standards that we, we also try and deal with. When you also look at the WTO, you have got WTO that has got principles. Now, these principles are, are outlaid so that countries can look at them. But firstly, they recognize that each and every country is a sovereign country that can also set up their own um, uh, conditions or import requirements. So that, that's rule number one uh, in terms of the import requirements. If you can just go to the next slide. Now, once recognizing that you, you would have a plethora or a battery of legislation within the country that are meant to deal with the issues around the exports. Um, you, you would have the Agricultural Pest Act, which is dealing with phytosanitary issues. You would deal with the Agricultural Product Standards Act, which deals with the quality aspects and also the labeling of products that we export from the country. I will also deal on the export side of these legislative pieces. You would have the Liquor Products Act. Yes, we deal with liquor products and we export quite a lot um, to other countries. So in, in terms of that legislation, there's an expectation of us to take action, regulatory action on that. There's also the Plant Improvement Act that deals with seed and propagating material uh, to ensure that that propagating material is distinct, it's uniform, and it's stable as we export it out of the country. You have got the plant breeders' rights that says that if I have got rights towards a particular um, a variety, then I have got to get the rights uh, in terms of proceeds 
when that um, variety, either in a form of a, a product, a commodity, or in terms of a propagation material, that I need to, to get the proceeds uh, because of the work that I have done on that particular variety. So that's something that we have got to look at. And um, the Portfolio Committee would know about the Genetically Modified Organisms Act or the GMO Act that you would get to a point where if you are selling a product that is a, GM, a, a genetically modified or GM as it, it's called, you have got to inform the importing country or that you have got those products and there are parameters that have got to be met. Because in most instances, um, if it's sold as a commodity, um, there are conditions. Some of the countries would say that you can only send, uh, let me use, um, maize in this uh, instance or um, that you can only send millimeal to them or ground maize uh, to them uh, and in terms of seed there would be um, an expectation that there would be a regime that uh, manages um, the gmos in that particular uh, country so in that state of sovereignty that is embraced by the wto you would also see it finding effect in terms of legislation that we are utilizing the, the next act would be the, the Meat Safety Act that deals basically with the safety of meat that we are, we are consuming um, or have got to export and um, will deal with uh, the aspects of um, also hygiene at abattoirs that we are having, um, which, which, which I will uh, talk to later on. Then we have got the Animal Diseases Act, which is an act that assists us in terms of ensuring that if we have got to make certifying requirements on any particular animal health certificate, then that has got to be reflected as such in that animal health certificate. Then you have got the act that we are currently discussing um, that regulates um, mostly the behavior of all those who are involved in terms of this process. I thought that we should also bring it in. And you have got other acts that are implemented in other departments like the Department of Health, where um, we have got to make sure that uh, whatever that we exp uh, export is safe. I've already spoken about the international arrangements that we have so that when we deal um, with the issues around exports, we know that we will be governed by the international agreements that we are party to and have got to deal with this. Now, the, the question that um, we, we have got to deal with uh, we have tried to narrow it down to say, let, let's look at a few products and not expand it because if we have got to give the, the entire value chain, we might um, have a lot of time to spend here. This is a diagrammatic expression of what happens when, when somebody has got to, to export. And before we can go into the real process, um, we thought that it's very important to understand how this value chain works. And we are going to utilize a typical uh, food value chain um, a process that we have got to look at. Now, if we have got to export, there are three ways that you can export um, from any particular uh, level. The first one would be where a country has got set conditions um, that are easily accessible by any other person. Um, a typical example in this case being the EU, where they would have a directive. And that directive would be saying to you, what are those steps that have got to be taken by a country before exporting? And those would also include in the first area of our work, what needs to happen in an orchard. Uh, prior to you picking the fruit and what needs to happen then uh, going forward. The second um, element in terms of export would be where there are negotiations between ourselves as a country and the other countries to ensure that we set up what we call an export protocol. Now an export protocol would go to a level of saying um, we as South Africa have got a product that we want to share with you as um, country X and country X would say, these are our import requirements. These are the expectations that we have uh, from you. And this is the certifying statement that you need to put on the, on, on the final certificate 
and we all agree on that. And that, that element might also go into the second pro process that is here around the pack house, or it can even go to this level where you have got import, um, you have got your ship or container, and I'll touch base on that. The third element um, in terms of the exports would be where you, you would get import conditions from a particular country where you request them to say, I would like to have products into your market and they would give you import conditions and those conditions would be something that then you have got to certify. Now, from an orchard, for instance, let's use in this case on our members citrus, you would then move to, to, to a pack house where you would have to observe a few issues. You would need to go through a process of ensuring that uh, from a phytosanitary point of view, in terms of plants, you abide with all the conditions. For instance, if a country says to you, you would need to observe that you do not have black spot on your, on your fruit, which is a spot which um, uh, is causing a lot of trouble now with us and uh, one trading partner, the EU, um, then you have got to ensure that um, when you find it, you reject the fruit at this particular level. And at this side, uh, place, you also have got to deal with the quality of the fruit, you have got to deal with the sizing of the fruit, and a similar process would, 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 would be uh, done with other products. Um, as, as we go through the citrus uh, level. And this work is mostly done by people who are in the pack house itself before they present it to the department or PPCB in this case, or in the cases of uh, animal products to the provincial department for an inspection. Now an inspector who's going to do uh, an inspection, uh, honorable chair uh, in the uh, third uh, line, who's going to do that inspection would be looking at the import requirements and looking through them and saying, is there compliance? When there is a compliance, then the person would pass it on to the next level. And if there's non-compliance, then there would be rejection. Now, this inspection can take two ways. You would have a quality inspection here. You would also have a phytosanitary inspection or in cases of other products, uh, inspections that has got to do veterinary inspection, you would have uh, hygiene inspections. So this is the inspection level that says yes or no for a product. But then you go to, to the next level where you have to, to deal with the cold store. One of the areas that is critically important is for us to deal with uh, the areas is to maintain uh, the, 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 the cold regime or within the whole process and therefore you'll go to a cold store. There might be uh, processes in terms of the engagements that might need to be taken at the cold store to see that the, the fruit is stored at a particular level. Uh, in the case of fruit, there might be pre-cooling that is needed to be done at this particular level. But then we go to your inspection, which now sets to say, let's look at um, the internal consistency of that particular product and then we ship it off it goes on to transport, uh, it's transferred, and then you start loading. Now, in this loading uh, area, Chairperson, which is in the second row, um, second from the right, you, you would basically have a few areas. If there is an expectation that you would have to have um, your consignment be subjected to a particular temperature regime, um, so that to kill internal uh, pests, then you have got to do it there and load into a ship or a container uh, where at times this expectation is expected to, to be done at that level. And then there is now shipping uh, that happens on the third row, the first one on the left, um, where you have got to now um, send it through to, to the other, other country. Uh, out. Uh, it so happens that some of the conditions that we are having with our importing partners would say, for instance, we would need this fruit to be subjected to a particular cold treatment in order to kill internal feeders, and it has got to, do, to be done in transit. Now, this level of engagement at this level would also say uh, allow for that um, number of days in transit where this is going to be done. 
Now, these other areas of discharge and inspection is on the other side where the consignment would be discharged and there would be an additional inspection. Now, one would ask why an additional inspection is a verification inspection because you have certified, uh, certified as South Africa that we are currently having um, compliance to the conditions that you have set. And um, if not, then the inspector here would find something. If they find something that we did not manage to pick up as a country or the inspectorate in South Africa, uh, be it PPCB, the department or the provincial department, then they send us a letter of notification to say, we have intercepted your consignment and your consignment would not be able to move to the next stage, which is the cold store, or we need to do certain things, or we can destroy the consignment, or we can reroute it to another uh, venue. Um, that, that, that those are the decisions, the regulatory decisions that have got to be taken at inspection, uh, third row, uh, uh, third line. And then if, if, if it's passed, then it goes to the cold stores, um, and then it goes to the distribution chamber and they do their own inspections in terms of quality, then you can have it uh, into the markets and supermarkets or consumers. That's basically what, what happens to a consignment. It's a simplistic way of looking at it, but I thought that because the issue here is about the, re the regulatory areas, um, we should concentrate on them. Chairperson, um, of all the areas that we are having, um, the, the, the first ones in terms of inspections, uh, we have got a very tight regulatory system, I think, in our country. The only issue that we have are capacity issues. Um, if you have got to see um, uh, the capacity levels that we have, both at national level, at PPCB level, PPCB is currently running, I think, with a lot of temporary staff that they bring in. Um, to, to do this kind of inspection. And that goes in terms of the levels that we are having. But I have got to say, we have got expertise in these levels. And um, I do not think that um, in terms of expertise, the only thing that we can do once we get additional capacity for, for the weaknesses that we are having is to ensure that we, we can deal with the, with the capacity issue. The second level, it's, it's, it's in terms of our engagements at international level to, 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 to comply with the conditions. And compliance is very different from, from, from your inspection or, or looking at things because you, you, you cannot inspect something to comply. Compliance starts at a very early a, a level of engagements. And therefore, that level of promotion and awareness to all those who are responsible for different areas in the inspection field it's very important. And, 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 and if, if there's one weakness that we are currently addressing, Chairperson, is, is at that level of, of ensuring compliance right through the, the value chain. We have got very good um, expertise, Chair, when it comes to uh, cold treatment, both within the government in terms of PPCB, uh, in terms of the PPCB Act and also outside in terms of the, the uh, uh, various uh, bodies that especially assist us when it comes to the export of our beef and maintaining the cold chain uh, within the, the engagements. Next slide. Sorry for taking long on this slide, but I thought that that was the slide that we needed just to look at them. Now, as a country, we have got various markets. I've already indicated the, the, the different ways in which we access markets. I thought we should just highlight the current work that we are doing. We export citrus to the Philippines, to China. Those are all the areas that uh, we, we have covered uh, from pears up to the export of beef. Now, each and every of those lines, uh, when it comes to the protocol, would mean that there has got to be total um, compliance. Otherwise, we stand the risk of losing that market. Now, um, it, it, it's, quite, it, it's, it's quite important because in most instances, our focus as a country would be on, um, on, on market access. But it takes a lot to maintain a market because as you can see, if we just look at China, the, the number of protocols that we have with them, the number of compliance uh, mechanisms that we need to have with them is quite broad. 
Now for each and every one of these, um, as a department, um, we have got these protocols and we are very transparent. We have got these protocols also covered and also reflected in our own um, website as, as a department. Now, you, 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 you would see that part and parcel of, the, of this would en en ensure that there is a lot of negotiation uh, chairperson. Most of the protocols that we negotiate take a lot of time. And I think the appreciation that we need to have is that um, protocol negotiation or a market access negotiation is mainly dependent on the importing country and how fast they work. Now, the, the NMC in their presentation have touched base in terms of market access. But what is important is that these days when you talk about market access, there is a new concept that is currently raising its head. It's called reciprocity where if I give you, you have got to give me something. And this is part and parcel of the new world order. I, I may not um, have a solution to it, but it's mostly that way. And most countries also deal with these protocols on a one protocol uh, at a time measure. So you do not, you do not have uh, all protocols being considered at the same time. And it takes a protracted period of time to discuss these protocols. And um, it, it's even worse when it comes to current issues around animal products or animals and animal products that you, 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 you would have quite a lengthy period because of a disease uh, occurrence in our country. The next slide. So when it comes to the EU, as I indicated, you, you have got what is called the directive, whether you are sending out your ostrich meat or you are sending out your, your food uh, to the EU, there is a directive that you have got to comply with. And um, on a number of times, we'd have the EU coming through to do uh, spot inspections through their inspection body uh, to see whether we still comply. We also have got the uh, protocols that we deal with with Japan. The next slide. And all of this, like I indicated, um, all of this are available um, for, 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 for Perusa um, if the honorable members would like to see these protocols. Now, the, 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 the last place was in terms of, of Thailand. And um, I would like to say, if we have got to look at how we deal with the protocols, the most important issue is to have a system that picks up changes um, in uh, import conditions very quickly. I have got to indicate that uh, somewhere in the, in the early 2000s, I think, uh, if not mid, we had lost one of the markets because we didn't pick up very quickly that the import conditions were changing. And when we went in, they said that the time was closed and it took us long to just get and claw back in terms of that market. So um, agility in terms of ensuring that we have got market access is very important and therefore if there's one weakness that we have got to pick up on is that early warning system in terms of the changes i would like to also indicate that in terms of the wto it is expected of each and every country to have their their new conditions being put up and therefore you need to have capacity to interrogate and capacity to to also send your inputs um in terms of the uh, i think the, 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 the principle uh, of uh, transparency, where if you have got new conditions, you have got to inform your trading partners so that they can also have an input in terms of your conditions uh, and how this this fan out. Which brings me to that element that uh, at this moment, there is a great discussion within the industry on the EU market and the new conditions that they are trying to put up regarding uh, citrus where there's an, a, a draft proposal to say citrus that's going to the EU has got to be uh, cold treated. Now, cold treatment means that we have got to, to lose quite a lot of money. Uh, farmers will be losing a lot of money, and that's something that we are engaging with the EU on uh, in terms of the conditions that they are setting, uh, where we are going to look at equivalent measures uh, on how we deal with, with that aspect and working with the industry on that. Uh, the next one. 
that there are fee and we we have products that are going to the us and we have got products that are going to vietnam Th these are just examples uh, honorable uh, chairperson and uh, honorable members of the pc they, they are quite a lot um, that we are exporting to um, based on uh, directives based on protocols and based on what conditions the next one now the, the process that i had covered in the slide earlier um, is 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 giving uh, some some highlights uh, on this slide where if you have got to look at animal products uh, there is work that is being done by the national department as a policy unit and you have got one that is done by the provincial departments uh, where you have got to look at sanitary issues you have got to look at quality assurance um, and then we have got to look at abattoir inspections. We have got to look at the Animal Welfare Act and other acts that are uh, applicable in this space. You have got to look at uh, one area that is very important for all of us is the issue around analytical and diagnostic services, um, which involves in this case, the, the uh, Agricultural Research Council, the uh, Underrestor Board uh, Veterinary Institute, which does a lot of work in this field. And then we go into the certification as signified earlier on. The, the next slide. Now we come to, to, to this act, Chair, um, which is basically now looking at the, the issues uh, that pertain to the act. And with reference to two very recent developments as early as 2018, where they were in, in, in a matter of three months, uh, rules that were set in terms of the livestock agents and rules that were set in terms of the export agent. This was in realization, Chairperson, that um, we, we might be having challenges in terms of uh, ethical citizenship of those who have got the responsibility to be livestock agents and also export agents. And therefore, we have got to look at the rules that would govern their conduct and ensure that they abide and would give value to those who um, have their products with them. The next slide. Now, the, the, the question that the chair and the committee had asked was to say, what kind of uh, engagements are we going to have if we have got to look at this level of uh, what is the current operational practice for those export agents and the, the livestock agents? And Chairperson, we, we give an outline to say, um, how do you go about to, to apply for this? This is very important, Chairperson, because this is the bread and butter if we have got to deal with the transformation issues and um, we have got to ensure that there is full a representativity within the, the value chain. And now, we, we, we look at the application for the Fresh Produce Agency. We look at the Fidelity Fund, which is something that I will talk later on, and um, dealing with the issues around how you, you would then have a trust account should uh, something happen, and then how do we deal with the issues around uh, the memorandum of understanding? Because if you have got to regulate conduct, that's where it comes. Because the, the issue around how local agents worked um, is an issue of importance. I know that, Chair, there were discussions that were here, but I don't think that we, we had gotten to that particular level of discussion. The next slide. The, the very same issue around how the export agents would register um, is outlined. But it's very important that if we have got to look at that process that was in the slide diagrammatically depicting the process, that's the process that is mostly in the hands of the export agents because they are the ones who actually go and negotiate business to business in terms of the markets where the products are going. And therefore, from point one, where there is a contracting between this agent and the uh, producer on a particular farm, up to a point where the product reaches the destination country and reaches the hands of a, a, a consumer, 
or at times is rejected on the other side. You would like to ensure that the person who has been given this wealth uh, by a farmer or a producer would be able to secure it so that we, 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 we have got ethical uh, conduct here. Now, these are the areas where we are saying you would need uh, to be registered. You, you would need to have a CIPC certificate. You would need uh, to have confirmation in terms of veg registration. And you have got to have confirmation of a, a, a good standing in terms of the tax clearance. Now, that, that level of compliance might not be agricultural chairperson, but it's very important to ensure that those who are engaged in business and using the services of business, uh, uh, government in terms of this are compliant to, to the laws that we, we are having. And there would be vetting and um, your accreditation of those directors who are, who are within that marketing. All of this pro process that is done by APEC it's very important, Chairperson, to, 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 to ensure that there is work that is being done. And you would expect that at the end of the financial year, uh, four months thereafter, there would be financial statements that are submitted so that we, we can know that those who are within the, this uh, area of work are ethical in their behavior and are of good standing. The next slide. Now, Chairperson, you have asked the, the, the implementation weaknesses, and those weaknesses would have been an, engaged in, in terms of where I thought we were legislatively, where we were in terms of implementation, inspection, uh, regulatory services, especially your, your diagnostic and analytical laboratories, and also in terms of the engagements, maybe to a lesser extent where we are in terms of ICT. But um, we, we reflect that, the, the current act in its, in its format has got a shortage in terms of regulating fresh produce agents. This has been discussed, but we thought that we should uh, buttress it because we, we basically having farmers or even producers who are most likely to lose if these screws are not tightened um, to ensure that the, the, there is a fidelity insurance, uh, there is a trust account, there's also insurance for the produce that the people have. So that when we, we deal with this um, and we find that there is non-compliance, there can be consequences um, for, for that. And there can be consistent um, re reference to, to the auditing process that would always check the compliance here. If we don't have that uh, chairperson, there's a likelihood that those who may have non-compliances on the other side, as signified uh, not so long ago with a case that I know of, would be uh, trying to utilize loopholes in the system to say, but this is because of uh, a company X uh, or government or any other uh, assignee of government to deal with the, with, with the issues. So uh, we, we, we really need to, to look at those weaknesses and, and the limitations that are there. Uh, similar to the limitations that we assist with um, in the other areas and the acts that I've spoken to. Uh, but this one is specifically on this work uh, around this, this act that we think is going to be a regulatory uh, around marketing. The next slide. The, this slide uh, continues, uh, Chair, um, to, to really say what, what, what the end game is. And the end game is to ensure that um, you, you would have a process of ensuring that there is a, a process of ensuring that those who are within the industry have got re-registrations over a period of two years, and also ensuring that um, you, you, you declare conflict of interest if, if there is, so that you don't have export agents who go out to Nkanduli and get the farmers who are producing citrus there and have a huge conflict and ultimately the farmers are not paid and Dalat and then NMC have got to respond to those. We also need to deal with the issues around um, training um, of the export agents so that they can be on top of the game and ensure that um, whatever that they are implementing becomes a prerequisite in terms of, of the act and also ensure that um, if there are any other convictions, whether local or export agent of livestock agent, this needs to be, to be reflected. And APEC then becomes a regulatory body to ensure that there is total compliance. Next slide. 
Jefferson, the, 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 the issue around compiled re registration I've, I've already spoken to. I've already spoken about the 2018 uh, documents in terms of compliance, um, uh, in terms of export agents and livestock agents. I think we can skip this one, but just safe to say that where we had the issue around the livestock agents and we have had COVID-19, there was an expectation that um, when there are auctions that are held, on top of the uh, rules that we are having, there were also rules that we brought in to deal with biosecurity at the auctions, my apologies. Now, the, the other question that was there was to say, what are the operational and regulatory differences or similarities between these agents, we have got a table, uh, Chairperson. There are a lot of similarities in terms of the first three aspects, uh, that um, there is mandatory registration with APEC, um, they act on behalf of farmers, um, and the, the other one is the risk for the farmer. And this is where we need to mitigate. That line number three that says that there is a risk to the farmer is the mitigation that needs to be brought in Chairperson. And then we look at the issue around the trust accounts uh, for protecting the farmers. Only the fresh produce agents have that. You don't have them in terms of export agents and livestock agents. Um, you do not have the same in terms of the contribution to FNLT funds. It's not there for export agents and it's not there for livestock agents. And in terms of this area, we're talking, we're talking big minds. If the South African um, exports have reached a, a, a level where we, we're reporting uh, just above in terms of citrus, just above 4 billion, then we, we should be saying um, it's very important that we look at this. We also have got to look at it um, based on the markets that are growing uh, in the Far East for, 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 for livestock or low. Um, we have got to address certain issues that have got to deal with welfare uh, on those. Now, the, 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 there is an issue around marine and credit insurance. Should some, something happen deep sea or while en route, um, we need to be looking at that particular area to say that uh, these are not um, the areas. Uh, the accountability to farmers, uh, Chairperson, um, the export agents um, would be the ones who would have got to have to be brought in. And then we have got to deal with issues around uh, theft or, or, or fraud and the convictions that uh, would emanate from the, the next slide. So in, in conclusion, Chair, um, we, we need to know where the country comes from, from 1996 to say, in actual fact, if we have got to look at the battery of legislation that we have from 1996 to date, most of them are dealing with compliance issues uh, from a biosecurity point, uh, animal health, plant health, uh, biosafety, um, food safety, meat safety, and also in terms of quality assurance. But in terms of the, the marketing legislation, we, we, we still have got to deal with quite a few legislative amendments. We are currently amending the Marketing of Agricultural, uh, uh, marketing of Agricultural Produce Act. Uh, Products Act, and we are also looking at the uh, current legislation under discussion. And therefore, if we have got to look at this, if we look at the export and livestock agents, we think that we will be able to deal with the issues. Um, there is a focus that we need to have around the regulator per se, and we need to ensure that there is protection of a farmer in this case, uh, who happens to be in this case uh, mostly uh, those farmers who are also struggling, uh, as indicated by the uh, issue uh, from NAMC. Chairperson, if you ask me what is the health in terms of our export um, uh, in, in, in this uh, era, I think we, we are in a healthy situation. We have got serious challenges in terms of animal health diseases, and that aspect is receiving attention on the plant side. Um, we need to strengthen the negotiation, um, including negotiations maybe in terms of the export of um, animal uh, seed stock. And um, we also need to strengthen our exports when it comes to diversification 
of markets. That's the revised uh, presentation to the PC. I submit honorable chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, DG, Tate Ramasodi, honorable members. Let us uh, appreciate uh, both presentations that have been put before us uh, from NEMEC by Dr. Tempia, as well as the departmental presentation uh, by the DG. <laughs> We will now engage with the two presentations that have been put before us. Let me invite uh, honorable members for questions of clarity or comments. Uh, honorable Tabe. Thanks, uh, honorable chair. Good morning to the minister, the leadership present in this platform, and my colleagues, and happy International Women's Day to all of us. And thanks for the messages that has been posted for us on the portfolio community chat group. Chair, my comments on um, NAMAC presentation, I just want to with the following, that chair, the reason why we requested this was to be able to align the inputs and the submissions that we will get from the public hearings on the bills that you have alluded to. And my take chair is that um, our focus and primary goal on dealing with export markets and access should be on improvement of the livelihoods of the smallholder farmers. The presenters are uh, alluding to challenges of transaction costs and uh, some barriers that they have indicated on inputs and uh, the like. But Chair, I want to know from uh, Namak, how are they assisting the smallholder farmers for them to access these markets, the export markets? I'm looking at issues, Chair, that uh, um, mostly cover your practices of uh, or mechanisms of markets, how they operate, issues of improving production, issues of grading, your grading practices, things like uh, post-harvest handling. Or do you have useful training for smallholder farmers for them to participate in this? And I'm looking at um, one of the recommendations on the study that they made to say uh, probably 30% of the production should come from your Black Commission agents. But obviously, these agents are, should be saving your smallholders. But how far are you on this? I have seen that for the past nine years, 2011 to 2020, it was just a minimal kind of production. But what are you doing in order to achieve that recommendation? That was, a start, that was coming from a study commissioned by yourself. There's also some recommendations and comments made, especially on different uh, trade agreements according to different regions. There's always a comment that says untapped export potential. We must explore untapped uh, export potential. How do you intend doing that? And how far are you on those ones? Have you also looked into your recommendation of using the after policies, your African trade uh, area to deal or address the high tariff costs? Have you gone into that or are you just making a sweeping uh, recommendation on that one? 
My other question is, what makes the input costs via domestic fertilizer expensive? I heard you saying they are now also following international trends and it has become expensive. Why, if it is domestic, why, what makes it expensive? Um, I would also want to check with them on issues of food security chain. But I have climate change in this country affected food production. Do we feel the effects of climate change in South Africa? And uh, what are the imminent threats of food security in this country if we have to focus on uh, addressing that? Chair, the DG also, when I come to his presentation, I like the way he alluded to the existing regulatory framework, those legislation. And I want to go back to what Dr. Peterson, the chairperson of NAMAC, cautioned us when he opened the presentation to say, we must be careful of legislation, probably so that it doesn't become an impediment on what we want to achieve. DG, are there any of the legislations that you alluded to that we would want to review or to question us? I saw you mentioned one towards the end of your presentation. But on what is the packaged currently that you looked at, do we have a, some work to do on this uh, legislation so that at the end of the day, we ease the burden, we increase access, we expand agriculture, especially for your whole, your smallholder farmers. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, Bertab. Honorable Mamuste. Uh, Chair, she is off the platform. Uh, she has, uh, she's going to attend the meeting. All right, uh, thank you. Honorable Mamun Babama. Uh, thank you, Chair. If you don't mind, I'd like to keep my uh, video off in case, you know, I lose the network. Uh, thank you very much to um, the presenters for both presentations. I have one question for the NAMC. Um, I don't know if these were explained, but I think I missed them. In slide 13, I'm not too sure whether it's, it's, it's my slide 13 or your slide 13, because you seem to have changed the slide, the slide somewhat. But uh, I'd like to ask, what are the enabling factors for South Africa to expand into the global market. You spoke about, um, you know, there is potential for South Africa to get into global markets. And I'm not sure I got your, um, your, your ideas on, on uh, what the enabling factors would be. And then I think these questions uh, will be taken mostly by Ntate Ramathodi. But um, where possible, you know, if, if the NAMC feels that it refers to them, then they can answer them as well. Um, with regard to mandatory online training, could, you, could the department please explain by whom the online training and online exam was created? Who were the service providers for these online training? And what benefits do they receive from each exam being written? And whether that increases per exam and towards what purpose the exam fee is used. So who created the training? Um, and what benefit do they receive from each exam that is being written? And uh, towards what purpose is, is the exam fee used? And then again, why must each director or member also obtain a registration certificate? And why must each director write an exam? Should it be done every two years together with a payment of the exam fee in respect of all directors or members? 
And if so, why? Then my next question is, how is it proposed that an exporter who occasionally also sells produce on the local market implements both the rules applicable to a fresh produce agent as well as an export agent? And um, a previous version stated, a previous version of the export agent rules stated that an export agent would only have to comply with rules applicable to export agents, provided its export accounted for more than 50% of its total sales. So my question on that is why was the original inclusion of a minimum threshold in a previous uh, version of export agent rules removed? And then around the discipline of export agents, um, I would just like to understand, because in one of the slides it said that um, the local agents are disciplined internally, if I'm not mistaken, and the, um, the export agents are disciplined, uh, I think they go to court. Why is there a difference on that? Could you just please explain that to me, because I, I, I cannot understand it. And what role does the Fresh Produce Exporters Forum play in that uh, in that in that uh, disciplinary process? Chair, I think I will stop there for now. Thank you, Honorable Mbabama. Uh, the Honorable Ntadema Diaza. Uh, good morning, Honorable Chair. And uh, well, and that the guy more than Ampusan. Ritsuil on a little so I angling. The Swede more than I caught a long elephant to Rubula Haiva. Honorable Chair and, and, and fellow members, well, I think the presentations come at, at the right time, though delayed with almost two years because the, the process of the amendment of the agricultural produce agent uh, bill was introduced to the committee and to parliament in 2020. And could, the delays could be because of a whole range of factors, including the COVID-19 outbreak and all of that. And during the two year period, of the introduction of this bill, the committee received various presentations. And some of the presentations by credible and outstanding uh, activists in, in, in the agricultural sector, individuals with uh, great interest in ensuring that there is food security in the country. Some of the presentations might have been lost in the process, but one such presentation was uh, brought to the committee by the Kangela Empowerment Trust, as well as the Bears Suom Burderai. And it's important that I mention and acknowledge the kind of presentation they made and the kind of questions they've raised before the portfolio committee. And the reference to them is important in that, in addition to the literature that one has access to, they crystallize, crystallized their presentation and the issues that the committee has to deal with for the enrichment of the discussions of the portfolio committee. And one such point which they have raised is that, which they have brought to our attention is that, that there's been a major shift in a global and South African citrus industry towards integrating the farmer to the markets as well as the 
global customer. And to that extent that there is little, if any, role that agencies that government has established play in the facilitation of the inter interface between the producer as well as local and global custom. And the question they ask is, with the kind of proposed recommendations that the bill seeks to effect, what any role these agencies that facilitates interface and interaction between the producer and the customer plays, if any, at all. The other point which they raise, they raise sharply, Honorable Chair, is that in the citrus industry, additional cost in the value chain is inevitably carried by the citrus growers themselves. Secondly, that reduces return back to the farm in the form of profit, and that affects negatively their profit margins, and that put more pressure for increased input costs in excess of the consumer price index. And they make an outcry how this bill will ease the burden of the financial strain that is put on the growers themselves in absence of some form of subsidies that government can offer. So these are most important questions. Perhaps the presenters, the DG and, and the other people who made presentations before I joined the meeting perhaps could help in finding answers. And lastly, the point, the question that they raise is, with the kind of regulatory mechanism between the growers themselves and the agents, most of them are linked with the growers through internet and other advanced methods of engagement. And these agents are located in far countries. And some of them may be fly by night, some of them, their credentials are known, and growers run the risk of exposing themselves to such unscrupulous agents. The question is, with the proposed regulatory mechanisms to accredit agents who are in foreign countries, what effective instruments the legislation will put in place in ensuring that no unscrupulous agent have access to our growers and that our growers are not exposed to such activities of unscrupulous agents who are far away in foreign countries. It's important that these questions in this meeting and in going forward find answers, Honorable Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Matthias. The Honorable Mamotreta. Mamotreta. Honorable Memasho. Memasho. Honorable Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a bit with my network. Um, good morning. Honorable Chair, let me not switch on my video for now because the network is a very big problem for now. Um, 
I have been in and out during the presentation, but uh, slightly I had what the Mechabe was saying. Uh, my she covered me in most of the things that I wanted to 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 ask. My little input, uh, uh, taking into consideration that I have missed most of the deliberations because of my network, will be that um, uh, does our department have uh, systems in place that assist smallholder farmers to access those markets that we are talking about? I'm talking about... Uh, you know, in each and every company, according to my understanding, uh, the company must have certain policies and procedures that they operate on to meet the SABS standard for them to can be in the marketplace. Uh, because if any company that is operating without uh, uh, those uh, quality management system I'm talking about, it might be, you know, some of the problems that uh, our small farmers cannot be able to get into max into the market because their produce are not up to the level of SAP. So the question is, does the department have certain systems that they help those farmers in place? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Memasho. Uh, the Honorable Ntate uh, Masipa. Chair, good morning. Um, I hope uh, you find if I don't switch on the camera as well. Uh, Chair, thank you for the opportunity and to the department. Thank you and to the minister for the opening remarks. Chair, I think the president was quite clear during the State of the Nation that we got to deal with reduction of the red tape, primarily the cost of doing business. In terms of uh, what the president said and the bill that is before us, I think we're just doing precisely that. One of my colleagues said, uh, talked about the enabling factors. And I recall uh, Metabe talked about the how do the NA, NAMC support the farmers at real at the local level to ensure that they get access to the market. The bill before us, Chair, it doesn't address some of those things, and I think it's going to even make it more difficult. Um, if I listen to Ndade Ramasodi, there seems to be a concern with regards to the transformation in this particular sector. But I think the biggest challenge is not the bill that is before us, but I think is the environment, is enabling factors that needs to be looked at. And I think he did highlight the issue of the animal health, and uh, but. I would say, Chair, there are still several issues um, on the uh, fresh produce as well. A couple of questions, uh, Chair, that I'm going to ask. Um, I might not exhaust them all, but I'll try my best. There were changes made in 2012 and 2013 in this, um, of this particular bill. I think the question is that why was, was that amendment act rejected? Uh, if the department can really try and help us there. The second question, Chair, that I just want to maybe sketch a bit of a scenario here. When products are exported, um, we know that there is a risk at a producer level and there is a risk that gets passed to an exporter. So the reality is that uh, the risks are at both levels, at both the producer and the export agents. But Obviously, the issue is that uh, they are almost, um, you know, at every transaction uh, that uh, the exporter is involved, is involved on behalf of the producer. We know that. But also, there is a certain risk that the, pro I mean, the, the exporter agent really carry. And obviously, the risk depends on where delivery takes place and what international commercial terms is selected by agreement. 
for each specific transaction. And Dadera Masodi did highlight that it is important that we, we move with time, with speed. And uh, if you upset those commercial terms, the danger, uh, Chair, is that uh, we might find ourselves backward and even struggling to get those markets that we had. There are risks, obviously, uh, uh, in case of consignment sale, fixed price sale, and minimum guarantee uh, price sale. Typically, the producer carries the risk of an inherent uh, defect in the product when it arrives on the other side. Uh, but the export agents carries the risk in terms of the external contributing factors, um, specifically the incoterm that I've just mentioned earlier whose responsibility it was to arrange, for example, shipment of the product. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is that how do we, how do we see this proposed amendment um, able to differentiate between each of these instances and also you know, aiding uh, in terms of alleviating some of the pressure or the challenges? And further, we need to also, you know, answer this critical question as to how this risk, how the protection of this risk, um, or the, sorry, not the protection, but the fertility fund is going to actually ensure that this risk are protected as such uh, or eliminated. Because one of the things is how will such contribution be calculated? For example, in what currency, given the fact that products are sold across the world in different currencies, and if in, in rent, at what exchange rate? Furthermore, Chair, in the case of export agents who also sell locally, and they will be required to contribute in respect of both local sales and exports, and if so, in what proportion. So the bill does not really give us that uh, kind of engagement. So Chair, if you just allow me to just uh, mm -hmm. uh, add more, two more questions. So the question is that will export agents be prohibited from selling products in the market where it is impossible or too expensive to obtain credit insurance? Even where such markets represent up to 40% of export market. We know that the majority of our African market, our Middle East market, our Bangladesh, they have got this credit arrangements problem. And uh, even we struggle with uh, uh, what you call the credit guarantees and so forth and so forth. So the issue is that if we implement such a rule, um, we'll take away obviously up to 40% of the export market. And let's talk to what Ndadera Masodi said, you know, that the, the market can be very, very fragile. You know, once you lose the market, it's very difficult to go back. And it's going to take you another 10 years to start negotiating and engaging and getting the market back. And obviously, your farm gate returns will be affected. Sustainability of the sector will be affected as such. The, the last um, uh, question, Chair, is how is it proposed that a trust account be administered in instance of an export agent's business, where, for example, first advances and production loans are granted to producers by export agents? in order to enable them to produce their crops prior to any funds being received by the export agents. Chair, I think we got to understand that there is time factor in terms of export. So the farmers will wait for two years maybe to get their money from the export. And obviously the question is during that period when you know the shipment is still crossing the sea, getting to the other side, the farmer needs to continue with his work. And most of the time, the export agents do really subsidize that. So I think the, the big question for me, Chair, uh -huh. is that um, how will really this um, uh, bill in particular be addressing some of those issues, uh, uh, you know, where a farmer really, I mean, a, a farmer depends on the export agents who must also, you know, take additional risk or a pay out additional money to create this particular fund. And the administrative task of putting this particular fertility fund is not an issue of overnight. It's going to be really very costly. Chair, I think that's really from my side. Um, 
But I think uh, really, to be honest, uh, we definitely need to look at this bill very, very carefully. Uh, maybe the last one is the issue of reciprocity. Um, Dada Ramasodi spoke about reciprocity. And uh, from the NAMAC side, they did indicate that uh, we have got problems of tariffs up to 77%. The question that I have to NAMAC is very simple. Is, is what are they doing to address this particular issues to ensure that, you know, uh, we deal, uh, we, we find that reciprocity, you know, uh, uh, in dealing with this matter. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Tadema Sipa. Uh, the Honorable Member Shazi. She's not in the platform, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chape. Akbare Priet. Mora Fuerceter. Ogandet. Good in self. Kes baie goed. Kes blij. Chairperson, um, maybe from my side, and I would just like to concur with what um, the Honorable Masipa has said. Um, to the president spoke of of you know um, relaxing red tape and actually getting our economy going, and I couldn't have said it better when he says it just feels as if we're adding more red tape. Um, this is exactly how I'm seeing this bill, and there are a number of red flags that I think a number of my colleagues have addressed quite extensively. Chairperson, maybe just to add, um, Honourable Masiba referred to the bill. Um, that was introduced to Parliament in 2013, and that was subsequently um, retracted by the Department. Now, this current bill that we are seeing, having been tabled again, as Honourable Matias has said, in 2020 and before us now, um, has um, many, if not most, similarities with that bill that was found to be un unconstitutional, and that was the reason or one of the reasons for its withdrawal. Um, why are we seeing minimal changes to that 2013 bill now? Um, is the Department of the view that they have really addressed the issues? Um, um, in this bill, um, specifically taking into account, Chairperson, um, not just export and the export market that has not been, um, to my opinion, been fully um, actually, you know, encompassed in this bill um, in terms of um, the Fidelity Fund and, and the issues that was identified in terms of that, that. And can the department just explain to us how they got to, to this new bill, if I can call it that. Um, and I'm saying it new bill in on Arling Stierkens because I don't think, <laughs> I think um, as my colleagues have said that we need to work on this. Chairperson, um, what, what worries me Honorable uh, well, Dr. Ramasodi uh, mentioned that the early warning systems um, in terms of exports are still flawed, Chairperson, and maybe, um, and this is not directly related to the presentations we have um, we have received, but, but the, the Honorable DG did make mention of that in terms of our early warning systems and in terms of our diseases. Um, in the Northern Cape, um, to a large extent, we've seen... Um, Chairperson, and you'll excuse my Afrikaans, I can't think of the English word for a mughi, um, a mughi plog that we've been seeing, um, you know, um, in the Northern Cape and surrounds the Western Cape. That's now besides, you know, um, uh, all of the other plagues, if I can call it that, the locusts, uh, et cetera, that we've seen, you know, coming from late 2021 onwards. And then chairperson taking into account Rift Valley fever, the latest outbreaks in terms of that, if we look at um, blotong, I don't know if we directly translate blue tongue into English, um, and the fact that OBP does not have the necessary vaccines in place for that. How will that impact our exports as well? And how are we ensuring that we aren't having an instance where we do not have vaccines, we cannot properly insulate or, or, or um, quarantine, if I can call it that, you know, certain diseases, um, and then at the end of the day, lose those markets? 
chairperson, um, I've spoken about the overregulation um, of this. Uh, the DG did make mention of especially the um, export market that used to be deregulated. And I think Honorable Mabama spoke and, and covered quite nicely in terms of how are we going to find that balance? What does it speak to in terms of if you have an export agent who is now a local agent and an export agent, and maybe chairperson just to get into that line of thought and um, taking the agents into account, the definition of agents within this bill, um, and the instances and the requirements to have your, your insurances there. What happens in instances, and I don't think the bill speaks to that, of where um, the, the agent and the producer and the farmer are all the same thing. And now all of a sudden you have um, compulsory compliances in terms of insurances. You have um, compulsory BE requirements. Um, that cannot necessarily be met. What happens in instances like that? Um, what happens in an instance where um, it is a family business, it's been in the family for generations, and there is not necessarily a BE compliance towards that they are the agent, the exporter, and the farmer, will they now be um will they be refused um, to export? How are we going to handle that? In terms of, I think NAMAC made mention of 30% uh, must come from black producers. What if we have a market where we do not have 30% black producers? Are we then just throwing our hands up in the air and going, oh, oops, well, um, and we're losing that market, chairperson? Um, shouldn't we rather focus on the professionalizing of this environment? Um, shouldn't we be concentrating on, on streamlining, on ethical behavior, Chairperson? Um, chairperson, in terms of, um, I made mention of the contribution of the fidelity and insurances, um, and I think once again, my colleagues have, have clarified that, how are we going to um, buffer the implementation, the finances therein, um, with the market losses, the, in the industries we will lose, and the economic output we as a country will lose, Chairperson. Aren't we foreseeing that um, this will, at the end of the day, impact our struggling economy even more? It, um, in my opinion, is not going to. Um, actually speak to economic viability, um, economic improvement, um, and it will not speak to economic growth. Chairperson, then lastly, in terms of, and I think some of my other members mentioned it, um, this marine and credit insurance and the fidelity fund that we are speaking of, um, it's all very nice words, Chairperson, but we've seen issues in terms of the blended finance model. We've seen land bank. We've seen, ugh, we can continue, we can list um, a bunch of issues, a bunch of insurances, a bunch of funds that have been administered, that have been entertained, um, and that has not worked, that has not benefited our producers, our farmers, it has not, it has not profited our economy. Um, and then lastly, Chairperson, what is the financial implication of this bill as is having to implement that, having to implement that and the, and the financial implication in terms of our producers, our agents now becoming um, equipped to handle this. Um, chairperson, and maybe let me just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Akbar Priyat, the Honorable Kapa. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me start with the one of the, maybe just to get some clarity on the level of participation uh, on the public hearings, whether it has satisfactory or an insignificance. Secondly, Chair, the DG mentioned the part of the European Union and their practices. I would like to understand here whether these practices uh, are reciprocal. 
that we can also do the same thing of this uh, sporadic investigation and in uh, inspection. Are we equal partners in this state with the European Union? And next chair, there is a mention of the increase or the dominance of the market by few role players, which uh, maybe can be clarified if this is a norm or something which can be done away with. Next, on the, uh, and there's this thing of the 30% that was on your slide 14 of the 30% for local fresh produce market. Just to ensure that there is mechanism to ensure that this does happen because it uh, has got a, a lot of implications for the producers. And on your slide 19, again, chair, this is what Honorable Tape has mentioned that this increase of prices for uh, fertilizers which is worrying. This worry is because there is this conventional practice internationally that the producer, the primary producer, when they produce, the prices for the inputs are determined somewhere else for them and not them. And at the end of the production, when they market their product, again, they don't determine the prices determined by someone else. And therefore, I would like the, now the implication of this on the producers, the primary producers, this thing of uh, increased price uh, of fertilizers. With this, uh, on the last one, if it's not relevant, we can leave it out. I just wanted to understand if the current uh, American, European Union, Russian relations do not have any impact on the situation that we are in, in, handling at the moment. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kapa. Uh, Honorable Ndabe Zeta. The Honorable Montuedi. There's an apology from Montuedi, Chair. On the group. Thank you, Honorable Mbabama. Thank you, Honorable Trader. Honorable Trader. Um, sorry, Chair. Honorable Chair. Yes, you may proceed. No, Chaperson, cha I'm sorry, my network is giving me problems on this side. Um, Chaperson, mine is just, I think Che Utatutapa already covered me on that one because Che, I, I was about to ask a, 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 a similar a similar question that Honorable Tapa has, has covered me on it, of our, of our, how do we exploit the current situation of imports and exports? Are you done, Honorable Trader? Perhaps uh, maybe Honorable Members, let us uh, remind uh, 
the honorable members that the committee is not deliberating on the bill as yet, but we have requested uh, these uh, briefings to assist the honorable members for the, deliber the deliberations on the bill. The committee is still honorable members to hold oral public hearings on the bill to which the department will be able to respond to. Um, honorable member Shazi. Is there any other honorable member on the platform who I've not recognized and may wish to pose a question? If not, uh, thank you, honorable uh, members. Uh, let me uh, pose a few on my side. As uh, the, chairperson, the chairperson of NEMEC uh, board highlighted the uh, infrastructure as one of the challenges, particularly for equitable market access and participation of small scale farmers. How is the department, honorable members, addressing infrastructure challenges, specifically to ensure that small scale farmers are represented in export markets? Honorable members, uh, both the NAMEC and the department's presentation focused more on plant based export products which is understandable as they are the biggest contributors by volume to exports compared to livestock products, for example. However, while representation of black producers is in export markets is minimal, black farmers own most of the livestock in this country. How is the department, honorable members, assisting livestock owners, in particular in rural areas, to ensure that they gain access to untapped export markets for livestock and livestock products, notwithstanding the animal disease challenge that the DG alluded to? We continuously, as people in rural communities, uh, are subject to uh, injustices where, particularly when we go into drought, those uh, privileged few will rush into the formative BV states and rural areas to buy livestock at very minimal prices and then put them into feedlots for 60 days, 90 days, and send, sell them for a fortune after that. So I'd like to ascertain how is the department ensuring that we curb uh, this uh, uh, challenge rural communities are facing and we can be able to develop the uh, livestock uh, sector and ensure that they are able to contribute into the export market. Honorable members, on the basis of the proposed bill before the committee and to get an understanding of the reasoning behind the existence of the different marketing agents. Are fresh produce and livestock only sold domestically? What agricultural products do export agents market? And that would be all on my side. We will now hand back uh, to NAMEC for their responses, and then we will have the department giving its responses. 
Mau Angelo Peterson, over to you. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, you quite a, a lot of questions. I'm going to be filling in uh, where there's gaps from the export size based on obviously my experience in the export industry over the last 20 odd years, but I will give uh, Dr. Tempia and the CEO an opportunity to respond to their questions first, uh, particularly the ones for clarification. Uh, Dr. Tempia, CEO. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and uh, thank you uh, to the honorable members for the, for the questions. Um, a lot of the questions that have come up are policy and regulatory uh, type questions, which uh, I have agreed with the DG that uh, he will handle those. But uh, we will handle the questions specifically related to our presentation and that were directed uh, to us. And as the chairperson of the NAMC has indicated, he will come in right at the end just to conclude before, before DG uh, comes in, in case there are any gaps that, that are still there. Uh, Chairperson, uh, one of those questions that is probably uh, regulatory stroke policy related uh, that was asked by Honorable Masipa relates to the issue of re reciprocity in terms of tariffs. Again, I think uh, I, would, I, would, I would like DG Peps to, to deal with that. And I think th those issues are, are functions of negotiations uh, country to country. And uh, I think DG will, will be able to um, explain the processes that uh, usually uh, take place in terms of those negotiations. Um, I would like to then tackle the questions around how are we assisting uh, farmers to access the, the untapped, untapped uh, export market. And I think this is related to, to the question that was asked around uh, the enabling factors for South Africa to expand uh, into, into uh, uh, the global export markets. I think there are a number of factors, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, that one would have to look at in terms of creating the enabling environment, and I think DG will probably touch on some of those. But I want to touch on two of those for now, and, 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 and one of those, it, it's something that NAMC is, is directly uh, monitoring and, and coordinating with the industries. And that is the issue of export promotion. And it's very important, Chair, that uh, part of the investment that goes into looking for new markets uh, is, is that, uh, or should go to uh, export promotion. And as NAMC, we uh, monitor and, and administer uh, with the industry uh, statutory levies. And part of the, those levies, um, uh, part of that budget gets uh, spent on on issues of export promotion. However, Chair, we, we have noted uh, over the past few years that the, 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 this matter is not very well coordinated uh, between government and, uh, and industry. We have now started discussions with uh, the DTI who have uh, some programs that they, they are funding around export promotion and we're going to have a targeted approach where we we meet with the industries uh, that that uh, uh, have got uh, a promotional requirements in, in the export markets, and we're going to assist uh, in terms of how those those programs can be rolled out. Of course, uh, DTI uh, will, will lead will lead us in terms of that. But in terms of uh, uh, us uh, talking to industry and, and looking at how we can uh, assist them. I think that would be, that would be very key, uh, uh, Honourable Chair. So the issue of export promotion is very uh, important, and a study that we did to look at whether the export promotion expenditure over the past few years has yielded any fruit. Um, uh, we have done a study with the, within the horticulture industry, and we, we have done some analysis that actually shows very clear causality in terms of the investment that was made on export promotion versus the, the benefits that were ripped from that. So export promotion investment does pay. So that's one, one of the uh, factors, Chair. And I think I've alluded to the other one, which is more a matter of uh, 
um, a policy, which I think DG will, will, will touch on in terms of negotiations that need to happen. And, and of course, it doesn't end there, as the honorable members have indicated. It's very important that once the markets are secured, we need to be ready to be able to supply those markets. And all, type, and, and all types of farmers should be included, and, and smallholder farmers usually uh, are at a disadvantage. And that brings me to the next question, Chair, which uh, was asked in terms of how do we assist smallholder farmers to, to also benefit from opportunities created in, in export markets? Uh, this one is, is, a, is a big challenge, uh, Chairperson, and I think given uh, NAMC's uh, resource constraints, but also uh, issues of mandate, uh, we've been able to do some work, but on a, a collaborative basis uh, with the other government and, and, uh, and also private sector entities, where we've assisted uh, farmers to uh, be trained in terms of uh, uh, the issues of grading, the issues of uh, post-harvest uh, post handling, and so on. But the actual uh, investment that needs to go into making sure that they are export ready, uh, th that becomes a responsibility of the provinces, and we have uh, been working with provinces in that regard. And there was a specific question around uh, smallholder farmer access to national fresh produce markets. And there was a 30% target that was uh, 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 recommended by the Section 7 study that we, we, we did. Uh, Chair, again, this is a very uh, difficult one because the study was done quite a number of years ago. And if you look back at the number of years that have gone, and, and, and we are not really where we need to be. In this regard, we have had discussions with APEC, and I see that uh, Mr. Knowles uh, is here. And, and I think be, between APEC, uh, which is the body representing the agents and, and, the, and the markets themselves and government, we, we need to work on a system where we are able to first trace uh, very accurately the origin of the products so that the, the, our measurements are, are well informed into when we track progress. And then secondly, we need to put measures in place to ensure that uh, we provide training to uh, black agents uh, 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 because what you find Chair, also is that one of the realities is that there are established relationships between producers and existing agents uh, who, who trade in, in these markets and and, um, and 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 that 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 becomes difficult to kind of break into and one of the strategies would be to train black and upcoming market agents to to also access this space and, and this is these are discussions that are ongoing uh, with APEC at, at, at this stage. Um, Chair, I will, uh, I will just ask my colleagues to come in. Uh, there, there's a question regarding why is fertilizer uh, expensive, and I would like, I would like Dr. Yubert just to uh, uh, give a response to that. We've just done an anal analysis of what will happen now that the, the issue in, uh, with regards to Ukraine and Russia is escalating uh, and is likely to have uh, quite a major impact, even further than we are seeing now in terms of the prices of fertilizer. I would like Dr. Yubert just to explain uh, the determination of fertilizer prices and, and how that process works. And then uh, the issue of climate change, uh, I would like my colleague, Dr. Moses Lubinga to, to respond to, to that as well. And then chair the rest of the questions, I think the department will, will respond. Um, after my colleagues, then the chair of the NAMC will come in just to conclude and fill in some gaps. We'll start with Dr. Yubert. The uh, honourable members and everyone in the, the meeting, um, if you're looking at fertiliser, South Africa import around about 20% of, of uh, produce around about 20% of its fertilisers, and we import around about 80%. Um, in the past, it wasn't really viable to produce some of those other fertilizers, and now we're running in serious trouble. Although we are a world exporter of phosphate and also phosphoric acid, um, some of the reasons why fertilizers start rising already last year can be can be explained due to further world demand and also due to the exchange rate in a certain in a certain way. Um, the fertilizer production process is not so easy. It's complex. 
and it's also uh, very capital intensive if we want to go that route and we rather need to look further at uh, um, a lot of investigation if it will be viable or not. Um, what the impact will be on the Russian effect, I'm, I'm not sure. At, at this stage, we need, we need to see how long this whole issue is going to take. I'm not sure if Russia will close the, uh, the export programs towards South Africa. I hope it will not happen. Um, and yeah, this is, this is what I can say, but we um, need some further investigation into, into the whole issue. What will the impact be and start building scenarios um, around, around these issues? Thank you. Angelo? There was a question Dr. Tempia was supposed to cover. Is there nothing? Dr. Tempia? Okay, Chair, let me. You. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Chairperson. I think it was a question that uh, Dr. Tempia said one of the colleagues, Dr. Moses, could look at. I think it's the question that looks at the issues of climate change and uh, the impact on, on food uh, security. Uh, Dr. Moses, you can come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. And all protocol observed. So in response to the question of climate change and its impact on food security, uh, Climate change is a multifaceted phenomenon, and within South Africa, it's affecting food security through mainly the livestock sector or the poultry sector. When we had the prolonged drought between 2014-2016, we saw how productivity in the major sources of in the grain sector and also the oil seeds dropped and that transcended into the animal feeds that alone raised the cost of production for poultry and other livestock products food security wise that made many not be able to, 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 to afford the proper food basket to enrich their households. That is the lowest hanging fruit that we could observe how climate change is affecting our own people. For now, Chair, allow me to stop here. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, maybe just to add a, a very quick uh, input with regards to the, the work that we're doing with APEC uh, in order to, to, to track the dynamics around the access of smallholder farmers into national fresh produce markets. We are also working with the uh, uh, fresh Mark Systems, which is an IT company responsible for data coordination in fresh produce markets. Uh, uh, to actually put a system in place to track those volumes. And I think this, it will be a very important starting point uh, in us managing uh, that situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, thank you, um, Honorable Chair. I think our chair is ready to just come in to conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sampewe and Honorable Chair. Um, I think it, it's very important that um, in terms of our deliberations, uh, we take into a, uh, account the concerns raised uh, with regards to increasing red tape, the export industry with regards to fresh produce has essentially been self-regulatory for the last uh, 
20 odd years uh, since the dawn of democracy. Um, and as far as I'm aware, um, there has been limited losses to producers in terms of dealing with the, with the export market. Um, the DG has indicated to you the export value chain. And I can assure you that the process that is indicated is probably fairly uh, simple uh, in its simplest forms, but it becomes a lot more complicated when you deal with the international market. For example, we've got currently, we've got fruit destined for the Russian market. Now that fruit is now going to be diverted, repacked, different protocols. So the complexity, uh, again, relating to the international marketing of fruit should not be underestimated. Whoever drafts the bill needs to understand the implication of what they're drafting in the bill in terms of impact uh, operationally, in terms of how we, 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 we market produce. And I think that is, that is critical uh, that, we, that we do not miss that. Um, I have an appreciation that we need to create uh, a compliance and that there's an, 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 an understanding of the fact that you know, there needs to be ethical behavior. Uh, but most export organizations belong to the Fresh Produce Exporters Forum. Um, they can make their own representation. So to a large extent, you know, they will argue that there has been ethical behavior. But I can appreciate the fact that as uh, the department, we need to make sure that we do have mechanisms in place. Um, my appeal would be that we are fairly uh, smart about how we go about that. Uh, with regards to reciprocity and special markets, I, I believe it's an opportunity if we can get something in and we allow something back into our country. So um, the way we negotiate uh, is perhaps something that we need to consider, but that is not necessarily an area of, of expertise that I can speak on. Uh, in terms of, of small older farmers and the export markets, um, the export markets isn't particularly geared to small old, uh, small older farmers, as you need to be um, a certain size and volume, particularly uh, 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 in terms of marketing fruit. Um, I'll, I'll speak on that. Um, so what happens is there's cooperation between um, the department, uh, the commodity groups via the via the trust, and um, and um, as such, the, the 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 training that they receive would be on good agricultural practice, um, on inco terms, um, etc. So there is currently a uh, collective or collab collaborative approach in terms of assisting smallholder black farmers accessing. Um, you know, international markets, it's high value markets. So you want people to play there, you know, to move off the local market eventually and go to higher paying markets. I think that is that is very important. And the way the NMC plays a role there is obviously via the trust, but also in terms of, you know, ongoing research, um, you know, into the challenges. Um, Chairperson, I think, I think what is important is that um, I just need to mention that, you know, inter international trade happens around INCO terms. Um, and that's basically been, um, you know, what's uh, been the basis for, for interaction with exporters over the, over the last 20 years. So, you know, again, the drafters need to look at, at what is uh, the different INCO terms um, that is used to export products and the agreements between a producer and, and an export and an export agent. Um, I, I think it's it's important that we find a balance between regulation, um, you know, and um, the free market system in terms of what makes us as a country competitive. I think our it's important that we um, you know consider what other countries are doing and how it affects our competitiveness. Uh, I will stop there and. Um, I'm happy for the team to take further questions and revert in writing, um, you know, in, in terms of giving further clarification. Thank you, Chairperson. Did you?
Dr. Ramasodi. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Um, if, if Honorable Chair allows me, I would like to call on the CEO of APEC, Mr. Francois Knowles, to take the questions around the implementation part. He will then be followed by Mr. Stan uh, Mantata, who is responsible for marketing in, marketing in the department, and I will conclude in terms of those areas that might not have been touched on. Thank you, Chair. Honourable Chair, um, good morning, uh, honourable members. Um, and if you will allow me, um, I would like to request that uh, you acknowledge that I um, acknowledge all protocol ob observed. Um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to respond to some of the questions. Um, I was privileged enough to address the portfolio committee last year. Um, I think it was in March. So I would like to pretty much build on that. Um, first and foremost, um, I would like to just um, say a few things in terms of the work that we do for our very beautiful industry. Um, the first being that regulation should never be seen um, as to serve as a barrier of trade. And if you'll, if you'll just bear with me, I'm going to switch off the, uh, the video. I see I have some problems here. Um, so regulation should never serve as a barrier to trade, rather a mechanism to ensure ethical economic business uh, practices. So uh, having said that, APAC and myself as the registrar is responsible for the execution of the current act, that is Act 12 of 1992, and then the amendment act or the bill that is um, on the table, if it is so enacted, and we will do this on the basis of serving um, the, the, the function on behalf of the, the Department of Agriculture. So um, our primary focus is um, the protection of uh, farmers, producers, and growers. And we do this in three areas. I think those areas are well known. It's fresh produce agents, livestock agents, and export agents. <laughs> Having said that, it's uh, clearly understood that livestock and export agents on, uh, are not being regulated as comprehensive as uh, fresh produce agents are um, regulated uh, currently in South Africa. The inter interpretation of the bill from APEC side is um, purely to ensure a level playing field for agents. Uh, we focus on addressing unscrupulous role players in the industry. And um, if uh, we did not have such uh, people, uh, APEC would not have a work to do. And uh, it's important to just reiterate the fact that agents who represent farmers do so and they represent the livelihood and um, obviously this must be very transparent. But the one important um, comment that I would like to make um, with the, the bowl in the background is that our beautiful industry must be an inclusive industry for all. So having said that, um, with, when we were privy to share the information about the proposed bill and the public participation process, APEC um, made really sure that we uh, informed all the role players that we regulate, that being uh, the agents and other role players in the industry like farmers, of the intent of the department to, to publish the bill. Uh, it, is, it is really important that all role players need to be able to partake in this process if we want to get to the ultimate truth. Uh, we see the, the process um, as ongoing, and of course, information is key. Um, we need to know what we don't know. And I, I, I can honestly say that in this process, we are learning um, a huge amount from the people that we uh, talk to, from listening to people like yourselves, um, and interpreting all the different questions and probably all the all the problems that are um, are, are recorded. So um, it's important that if we look at the essence of the bill, um, I would like to touch on two aspects: it's the disciplinary processes that are lacking for livestock and export agents, 
things like trust accounts, but I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, when we touch on the questions. Currently, the APAC Council consists of 18 members. Those members represent the industry at large. They represent agents in the three areas, livestock, fresh produce, and export. We even have people um, representing the consumer the council. So the consumer is just as important in the work that we do. Um, if I can um, then jump to the questions, if, you'll, if you will allow me. And in doing so, I just want to make the following statement. APAC is a creature of statute. That, re that means that we have a regulatory framework um, where I cannot move outside um, my mandate. So my mandate is embedded in legislation and that is what I receive from the department and that is what I have to do. Answering the questions of honorable, and, and please forgive me for my pronunciation, I'm, I'm terrible at this. Honorable Mbama um, asked questions about uh, training. So let me answer training as follows. The service provider, um, we use a service provider, but the IP of training belongs to APEC. So that is um, in our hands and we are key and uh, a pivotal in the development of training programs. Simply, we, we want to convey professional conduct to our agents to make them the best that they can be. People that um, have to undergo these, uh, this training, undergoes the training, and this also alludes to the question about the directors. It's a once-off training, and the training simply um, explores the uh, current legislation and then conveys that, um, uh, the content of that to the agents that must undergo. So the intent of uh, APAC with the training of uh, directors is to, to upscale and upschool them so that they understand the intent of the legislation and how we regulate and what is required as an output and the goal of such a training. The, um, there was a question about um, discipline of, of export agents. Yes, uh, currently we do not have internal processes to to deal with that and we have to go to court and get interdicts if we find um, unscrupulous and uh, agents who are not properly registered or who do not serve the industry as they should. Uh, and then let me just see. Um, okay, so um, it's important to, um, to just also um, touch on local market versus the export market. The protection of farmers is um, for, for, the, for the local market is done through a fidelity fund. And uh, this protects them against two things, that is theft and fraud. This is done in terms of section 12 and section 23 of our act. Um, this was removed in the previous uh, legislation. Unfortunately, I'm not privy to the reasons of that, but I just want to, to make that statement. Then, um, uh, honorable, Matiasi, um, there's always the risk of unscrupulous agents. Yes, um, please remember that our focus is on ethical behavior. That's a very definite goal of the bill. And uh, we would like to um, ensure that farmers who make use of the aggregated services of APEC registered agents um, are protected against people who will take chances and who will touch their livelihood. We must be very, very sensitive about the farmers that are protected in this way. Um, I hope that answers that question. Let me then just move to um, Honorable Noko. Um, the one thing that I firmly believe in the work that my team and I do is that we need to try and reduce red tape. Um, however, um, having said that, when you, when you work in this environment, uh, paperwork is important, but I don't think we need a paper um, overload. And um, I, I'm very, very, uh, I'm a very big supporter of trying to minimize red tape so that we can get the job done and the pr protection to our farmers out there. 
The other protection um, of the Fidelity Fund will work for exporters and livestock agents is something that must still be um, worked out in, deep, in detail. We will have to take a deep dive in that area. Um, there was also a question about what exchange rate um, is achieved overseas and how is that uh, disseminated to the farmers and the, and, and the growers. Those are all important aspects that we currently regulate anyway. It's contained in um, the sets of rules that we implore to give effect to the Act. And um, transparency for the farmer is really important. Uh, a farmer cannot um, continue his business if he does not know if it will be profitable or not. Um, in terms of the usage of the Fidelity Fund, how it's currently proportioned, we use a sliding scale on the uh, success of the agency, and um, that works well. And this is something that is also uh, determined by the council, the 18 council members that I alluded to. This is, um, this, these are decisions made at that level, and um, it then serves the industry um, as a whole. The, um, Okay, the gaps for the bill um, will certainly, um, or, or the difficult issues um, contained in the bill is certainly the credit insurance. We have given an opinion on that um, to, um, in our uh, public participation uh, comments. So we need to ask the question whether this is viable and we've made a, um, quite a comprehensive input on that, uh, on that front. Then um, the shipment and the farmer, uh, communication and how they are paid is really important. And I think um, through the public participation process, we learn that there is um, re really new processes that develop um, that we should be aware of and that we should be very um, sensitive about. If I can then jump to um, Honorable Briet. Again, there was a comment about re relaxing red tape. We are in agreement of that. We um, need to make it as um, streamlined as possible. Um, sadly, I cannot um, react on why the bill 2013 was retracted. Um, perhaps the department can, could, can assist um, in that regard. There was uh, also a question about financial implementation. How will that be done. Um, are we ready for that? Can APEC accommodate such a change? Currently, uh, we are um, awaiting the feedback from the PC and uh, we are um, exploring possibilities how to implement um, once uh, a bill might be approved. What I can say is that we do not have the current resources to deal with the objects of the bill. But um, that does not mean that we um, should sit back and wait for something that might not happen. We should be ready and we should be vigilant if there's a change on the way and we're doing that uh, currently. Um, Honorable Kappa, um, there was a question about the level of publication, uh, uh, participation rather. I just want to allude to the fact again that APEC um, try to communicate on a regular basis as wide as possible to make sure that we make people out there aware of the fact that there's a bill, um, of, uh, a possible bill for uh, implementation sometime soon. So um, again, just allow me to make the comment that the more inputs we get, the better um, in a democracy. Um, if we get everything, we will eventually get to the truth. Then honorable chairperson, um, your um, questions I also would like to make one statement there. APEC only deals with agricultural products. Agricultural products, um, it's, it's a term that is uh, properly defined in the current act, and we only deal with livestock and fresh produce, which is fruit and vegetables. Also, um, the question is, how do we protect rural communities um, in terms of the comment that was made for livestock? Currently, um, we've uh, lost our status uh, with, at the OIE. This is um, because of the outbreak of foot and mouth disease in uh, November 2019. And um, the ultimate goal of the 
the bill will, amongst others, be to protect our rural communities who make use of the aggregated services of uh, livestock agents. That is but one um, example. Um, I hope I did not miss any important questions. If I did, please forgive me. But in, in um, conclusion, I would like to just make the following um, final remarks. You have heard that we work hand in hand with the NAMC. The dissemination of information is really very important so that we can understand what is happening in our uh, beautiful industry. We need to know what figures are, are, are achieved, what volumes are moving, and um, then allow me just to again reiterate, we need an all-inclusive agricultural industry, and um, that is something that is really important in going forward. Then um, from where I sit and the work that I do, I firmly believe that there should be a very healthy and balanced um, regulation focus between um, the regulatory aspects that we deal with and good business. Again, we should not be the um, entity that impedes business. So uh, with that in mind, um, if there's any more questions, I will gladly revert to anything in writing if more information is needed. Mr. Chair, um, I hope that um, was comprehensive enough. Let me stop there. Thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Mankhat, Mankhat. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, DG. And, and also let me take this opportunity to thank the, the honorable uh, members uh, on the opportunity. Um, I think uh, Mr. Knowles has covered most of the, the questions that uh, uh, I think I would have commented on. But maybe I can add on the issue around the, the rejection of the, the initial bill in, in 20, 2012. Um, I think what had happened there, um, um, <clears throat> there, was a, there was a challenge. Uh, at that time, um, whereby the original bill, I think uh, the, there was a proposal to to amend um, uh, 30 out of uh, 35 uh, sections, and 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 the legal opinion that we got at the time was that um, effectively it will mean that uh, we we are coming with a with a new act uh, altogether so that uh, was not uh, going to be uh, practical uh, moving forward and again there was a there was an issue around um, um, uh, the impact of uh, those um, uh, changes where now um, there was a there was a there was a proposal to to move the the current uh, a, a, a pack into into a, an agency where amongst other things uh, they were supposed to be looking at uh, issues around um, uh, uh, transformation and and the and, and the conduct of uh, agents uh, thereof and it was felt at the time that uh, that uh, may not be in line with what uh, we supposed to be to be doing so the safest thing would be that to, we need to withdraw and then we go back to the board and then we we develop a, a new um, 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 uh, proposals in terms of the areas that uh, we would want to to effect. And what they proposed at the time was that we rather focus on the <clears throat> the conduct of the of both the the uh, fresh produce. I mean, not not the fresh produce, but the the um, the exporters as well as the the livestock um, um, uh, agency. So it was more of a technical issue to say that uh, we we if we were to amend 30 out of 35 sections then it means we have to come with a new act altogether which uh, was not uh, desirable at the, at the time that's the reason why the the original bill had to be withdrawn and then be reworked uh, into the current format thank you very much uh, dg thanks Thank you very much, Honorable Chair and um, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee. Uh, let, let me first start, uh, Honorable Chair, by indicating and really appreciating the depth of uh, discussions and the questions that were asked relating to this bill. 
I think the discussions today, as you have rightfully indicated, that this is not the day to discuss the bill. I think we'll go a long way in terms of deepening the, the objects of the bill and how the bill is implemented. And therefore, I would avoid going deeper into the discussions, but go to the issues that pertain to the questions that were asked relating to the department. I'll start off with Honorable Tlape, who was asking, what kind of um, regulatory frameworks are we coming up with as a department to currently deal with the challenges that are in the export environment? Quite a few legislative pieces were introduced in Parliament, um, in this case, the phytosanitary bill, uh, which will deal with the uh, plant health aspects. And we also have got the um, agricultural products amendment bill, which is also a part and parcel of that uh, battery of legislation that we have brought in. What we will still bring in, uh, Honorable Chair, would be the Marketing of Agricultural Products uh, uh, Act. And we will also, as discussed uh, earlier on with the joint uh, committee that uh, this August committee had with uh, Environment uh, Forestry and Fisheries, uh, or Inverted uh, Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, uh, there is also the animal welfare that we will also bring in. And we will also have to deal with the issue around PPCB, as we, we, we know that PPCB is acting on a legislation and in their own uh, inputs to, to Parliament, they are looking towards uh, Parliament assisting in terms of dealing with that act to, to make it uh, more aligned and more recent. Uh, those are the areas that I think in the immediate uh, engagements on our roadmap would be needed uh, for engagement. Um, I, I wouldn't go to the issues that uh, Honorable Mbabama had raised, but I think those are real uh, issues that pertain to the uh, bill, as are the issues that Honorable Matias had raised, but also to, to, to abide with, with what he had indicated uh, around carrying of the costs and how this needs to be looked at when we deal with the bill. Another Marshall, yes, there are systems within the department to deal with uh, smallholder uh, farmers. But in the interventions, I think right through um, in listening to the NMC, listening to also the colleagues in answering, they, there is a need just to bring it into one pot where the interventions would be dealing with the issues that are, are later addressed that Honorable Chair was raising on infrastructure. But we, we, we have got units in the in the department that are meant to deal with a smallholder farmer amongst the farmers, amongst the work that they are doing uh, within your import and export uh, area. Uh, we have got a unit in the department called um, Import and Export Services, uh, which looks at this aspect. We have got the SA gap that you are implementing with PPCB, and also we have got the um, horticulture program that we are running with Japan. Uh, that is looking at uh, addressing the, the areas uh, on, 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 on uh, sustainable uh, horticultural development in our country. And these interventions meshed with what is happening at the provincial space is meant to ensure that we have got a systematic way of dealing with, um, with smallholder farmers. I think if we also look at the commercialization uh, aspects that we are having, uh, that was started uh, four years ago or five years ago. Um, those are the interventions that we are having through interventions with the, um, the jobs fund and also with the blended finance, noting that uh, Honorable Britt uh, later on had indicated there are challenges in terms of the, of, of the blended finance, which I think uh, there is a lot of positivity in terms of that area of work uh, by the, the funding that we still have got to advance to some of the service providers in terms of the banks. I think one of Masipa was um, actually very pertinent in terms of the issues that he, he had raised. But I would like to, to just touch base on, on one issue around the ease of doing business. And I think if we have got to look at the, the criteria broadly in the indices that are being used today, the issues around um, trading across the borders that he is bringing in mostly. And I think that uh, as indicated by the chairperson of the NMC, and I think even Honorable Masipa was very emphatic on it, we, we really need to find a sweet spot. My um, 
analysis chain is that if you have got to have ease of doing business, there are two issues that you have got to look at is consistency in terms of decision making and also ensuring that at the end of the day, you have got redress when you, 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 you have got certain things happening within the system. And I think if, if those, those two criteria that I, I, I would advance are met, then we are bound to find what I would call a sweet spot in terms of legislation, uh, ensuring that the, it's not acting as a barrier, but as an enabler towards uh, this area that we need to, to really transform. The, the are areas that I have taken note of that I will discuss with the NMC um, as a provision from Honorable Masipa. Uh, on Honorable Brett, um, the you, you had asked two questions, and I think maybe I need to paraphrase uh, the early warning systems that I was talking about was on the on the market intelligence that you need to have if you have got a trading partner where a trading partner would be changing conditions and you would be given a heads up of saying that this is coming and therefore you can start working on certain things uh, within the country. But what you referred to in terms of early warning, in terms of diseases, is also equally true. Um, you have referred to mechis, yes, mechis in English are mages, and um, you can also translate directly in terms of blue, blue tongue, it's blue tongue in English. So um, we, we really need to, to look at those areas. And I think that the, the, this portfolio committee will assist with a discussion on how do we then deal with the vaccines. I would not um, replicate that discussion here today. The chair had uh, guided the last time that we appeared in front of the portfolio committee. I think the, the, the issue around reciprocity, um, there, there has been indications, I think, from uh, various uh, honorable members of, of, of the PC on how do we deal with it. I mean, you, 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 you in a negotiating environment, you have sometimes to, to just slide with the punches and uh, go according to what you are provided with. That is why in terms of negotiation, one of the, the rules that you have got, you must always play it by the ear and see how far you can get. And for fear of um, just uh, outlining certain things that we do as we negotiate, I will not go further than that, uh, Chairperson, if you allow me. Um, the, 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 the issue around the financial uh, implication of the bill, I think, Honorable Britt, is something that has got to be looked at. And not only in terms of implementation, I think in terms of implementation, you have got APAC, but I think th there's also that offset that Honorable Members were, were looking at to say, how is it going to cost uh, even the role players within the, the engagements? Honorable Tapa, I think the the, the issue around sporadic inspections that we are having, yes, we, we are having that. We, we needed to have one with the EU. Um, unfortunately, due to uh, COVID, we have not done that. And that was relating to the import of poultry into South Africa. Um, and I think the issue around the domination of uh, stakeholders on Kappa in a particular area is currently being addressed by the department, the industry, and the um, sector partners, including labor uh, and civil society, in a document, um, a compact called the Agriculture and Agroforces Master Plan, which um, once concluded, we will be able to share with the uh, portfolio committee. Now, Honorable Tapa was asking, what is the impact of the current uh, US-Russia um, um, uh, uh, engagement um, on, the, on the issues in this country? I think there are a few documents that are quite available in terms of the impact for the agricultural sector, where we are importing a lot of uh, wheat from that particular region, 30% to be exact. And we also have got the uh, citrus that goes there. And um, we are currently finalizing and having a meeting at two o'clock with a certain industry players just to look at the options that we, we will come up with, uh, which will build a scenario plan, um, starting from the, the easier scenario to the worst case scenario, which we will then avail. Uh, to say, if this happens, this is how we will have to respond because there might be an issue around forward buying uh, in other areas. So we need to see how do we, do we deal with that because that becomes a food security issue and uh, in terms of export uh, trade issue 
uh, for our country. And if we have got to find new markets, um, it's something that we also have got to do. And thanks for, for that question. Honorable Chair, you, 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 you have uh, identified and put your pulse on the thing, uh, on, or, or you've put your finger on the pulse sort of about that, on the issues that we, we have got to face when we deal with uh, infrastructure in our country. Um, and part of that that we, we had started with was the National Red Meat uh, Program, which we presented to Parliament, uh, uh, to this uh, portfolio committee, where we are also dealing with aspects of how do we build infrastructure, but on top of the infrastructure, how do we also bring expertise and also ensure that we localize uh, these value chains and ensure that we have got local auctions and ensure that those who might be unscrupulous and needing to get um, money out of the system would find it difficult because we add in value at a particular level. I think the, the, the issue around how people utilize this drought with this national red meat produce uh, program, we are looking also as, 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 as at having customized feed loss, um, and this will be run through the ARC. This is on top of other engagements that we are having um, on a government uh, level where we are dealing with uh, financial uh, interventions, including the comprehensive agricultural support program, and also the land development support that is dealing with this. I think, Chair, the, the issue around the export agents, um, as you rightfully indicated, could be ventilated at that time when we, we, we have got to deal, um, uh, respond to the parliament dealing with, 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 with the bill per se. Chairperson, those are the areas that I thought my colleagues would have uh, just left, but um, uh, have covered. If there are any other issues, Chair, um, we, we are happy to oblige with a written response. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, TG, Dr. Ramasodi. And let us also uh, thank uh, uh, NAMEC as led uh, by Ntate Angelo Peterson and uh, Dr. Tempia and everyone. Uh, Christo Hubert and Francois Noels, uh, we appreciate your responses that you've been able to provide on the clarity seeking questions posed by the honorable members. We also take this opportunity to thank the officials of the department who uh, have been able to cover some of the questions posed by Honorable uh, Members DJ. Thank you uh, for the responses and we hope uh, that if there's any other uh, issues we may have, the Secretariat uh, will be able to capture that in writing and request them to be sent uh, to our respective office. Honorable Members, uh, that uh, having been said brings us to the end of our uh, session and uh, we would want to take this opportunity to thank all the honorable members who engaged and interacted with these presentations and for having to being always attentive in your questions of clarity and being uh, highly robust in engaging and uh, giving uh, input uh, to the presentations is much welcomed. We want to also take this opportunity to thank our staff, uh, the Secretariat, content advisors, uh, researchers, uh, as well as all those uh, on the platform that ensure that we are able to navigate through these meetings smoothly without any uh, interruptions. We apologize for those honorable members that have had a poor uh, signal due to load shedding wherever it may have been around the country. And uh, let us also remind you of uh, the sitting at two o'clock in the National Assembly, which will be a hybrid sitting. And we request you to join on time so that we may be able to follow the proceedings in the National Assembly. 
With that said, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and the great week ahead. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and bye bye. And bye bye, Chair. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Equal and that must check in, guys. Colleagues. Hello. You can hear me. You can hear me. Can you hear me? 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 Pumla hmm? is liberty hmm? minutes. Pumla, stop recording. Is liberty minutes. Show oh, minutes. I love my papa. I'm sure I'm a second. Bye bye. Bye bye, man. <laughs> Thank you. Stop recording. Stop recording. Recording stopped. Hi there, how are you? Who got that no second up? No YouTube, who is that? Not that much, yes.